Well, good morning, good morning, Arlington Assembly. Are you glad that you're here this morning? I am. I look forward all week to being with you, and I'm glad that you're here. You're here uh, in person and in the balcony, in person and online, wherever the camera is in. We want to welcome you. Uh, uh, my name is Sam, and, and uh, we're just glad you're here. If I've never met you, I would love to right after service. My wife and I will be right out in the lobby, and we'd love to meet you. But we're glad that you're here and that you're a part of Arlington, the Arlington Church family. And um, we're in a series, if you're just joining us, on the names of God. That little bumper video there kind of shows you that. But we've been in this. Today is going to be part three of, of a series entitled Call on His Name. Now, the purpose of this series is not just so we can have more information about God, right? Because we don't just want information, we want transformation, right? We want to know God better, yes, and we will through this series, and that's awesome. But the purpose of this series is that so we can know how to call on His name. How many of you know there's going to be situations in your life where you're going to need to know how to call on His name? Right? And, and the Lord gives us that. And so the reason why it's important is because when it comes to praying, one of the things that we got to have is we got to have faith. That because without faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must do two things, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Amen? And so one of the things that gives life to our faith is the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so when you're here at Arlington Assembly, you're going to hear a message from the word of God, right? Not my opinion, not any of that stuff. We're going to take a passage. We're going to work through it because faith comes from hearing the word of God. And the more we know God's word, the more our hearts can be filled with faith, right? So when we read through the Bible, uh, God reveals himself to us and his nature to us through his names. Now, these are names given to describe his attributes or given to describe his qualities, like El Olam, he is the everlasting God, or El Shaddai, we talked about that one a couple weeks ago, he's, he's the almighty God, right? So we've been talking about the names of God because they have an impact on our faith, right? Right? Now, his names tell us two things. His names tell us who God is and what he does. His names tell us who he is and what he does. And the more I know who he is and what he does, the stronger my faith becomes. And so the more I'm going to pray in faith because we know the things that are consistent with his name, right? So as we learn the names of God, as we begin to see them in the scripture, because different names are used in different stories because God is teaching us about himself. And you want to know what's so incredible? God wants us to know him. He wants us to know him. If he didn't want us to know him, he wouldn't have gave us his name, right? I mean, that's one of the most personal things you can do, right? When, as soon as you meet somebody, what do you do? You exchange names. Hey, I want to get to know you. My name is this. What's your name, right? If God didn't want us to know him, he wouldn't have even gave us his name, right? So the, God is awesome. And on top of that, I get excited about the fact that there's a place, yes, for crying out to God and saying, oh God, I've got to have your help. Help me, right? We, I think we've all prayed that. And he does. But did you know that there are other ways to get God's help? That, that, that there are other ways to see God work in your life? It's not just all help, right? Though that's a very appropriate prayer, and I pray it often. I prayed it this week. <laughs> but there are some other ways to get God's help that involve his name, specifically that involve uh, praising his name. Let me give you a couple scripture verses. Psalm 148, verse 13, let them praise what? Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name is exalted, alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth. His name who he is and what he does alone is exalted. Psalm 124, verse 8. Our help is where? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in his name. Our help is in who he is and what he does. Psalm 91, verse 14 through 15. Because he loves me, says the Lord. You see, when a person loves the Lord, let me just pause here for a moment. And, 
and when a person really truly loves the Lord, and uh, over the last couple of weeks, God's been uh, dealing with me on this, and and I've been sensing kind of in the body this drifting, and um, uh, from just falling, being in love with the Lord, and God's been having me pray this for you that you would just re-fall back in love with the Lord. This is one thing to say, you know, I I love the Lord. You can say I love the Lord all day long, but do you love the Lord? You know, you can tell when a person loves the Lord by the way they worship, by the way that they pray, by the decisions that they make, by how they live their life, by how they treat other people, right? Do you really love the Lord? And, 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 and if you're a person that's kind of been drifting from that, uh, I don't know who you are, but I've been praying for you uh, that, that, that you would re-fall back in love with the Lord that God would just reignite that. God, help me to fall back in love with you because it's important because uh, uh, when we truly love the Lord, look what he says, I will rescue them. I will rescue that person. I will protect them for he acknowledges what? He acknowledges my name. For, and, and he will call upon me and I will answer that person. So the more we know God, the more we know who he is and what he does, the more we're gonna pray with faith knowing that the Lord will answer. So we've been making our way through different names of God, and today uh, we're going to learn about another name. Uh, We're just going to do one today. Uh, This is part three. Part one, we did two names. Part two, we did two names. But today we're going to do one name, uh, and it's the name El Roy. El Roy. It's it's, uh, spelled R-O-I, but pronounced like Roy, like R-O-Y, then with two E's. Roy. Kind of, it's uh, El Roy. Uh, it's a combination of two words, El, which is God, and Roy, the, uh, um, the one who sees me. So El is used for God, so you see it in like El Olam. He's God everlasting. He's the everlasting God. We saw it in El Shaddai, God Almighty. He's the Almighty God, El, and here we see it in El Roy. He's the God who sees me, and we're going to discover uh, this is literally, he's the God who sees me through his goodness. He's the God who sees me through his goodness. So today, if you are alone or you struggle with loneliness, uh, because you don't have to be uh, alone to struggle with loneliness, or you feel like no one understands or you feel like no one understands you, God addresses this, and we're going to talk about this today. Uh, You know, you feel, uh, maybe you feel lost in the shuffle or maybe you feel uh, like you're lost in the crowd of humanity. There's a lot of people on the earth, and you kind of feel lost in the crowd. But God says, no, I am El Roy. I am the God who sees you. I see you. God says to you today, I see you. So let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into this. I'm excited about this one this morning. Father, we come to you. There is no one like you, Lord. Lord, now let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Now, Lord, we pray that your word would fall on the good soil of our hearts and may it take deep root and may it grow strong and tall and bear much fruit for your glory to build your kingdom and to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. How many of you like to be seen? You just like to be seen. You walk into a store or a counter. You like the people working there. You, you like to be acknowledged, right? A couple of weeks ago, I... Uh, a few weeks ago now, I walked into a restaurant, and I opened the door, and I, I kind of stood in the little lobby area there, and there's lots of people working there, and they're all over the place, and, and not one person uh, said anything to me. It was like I didn't even walk in the restaurant, and, and not, even any, not even any eye contact or nothing. Everybody's just real busy, whatever. So after a few minutes, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, uh. so I approached the counter, right, and, and I kind of stood, stood there for a few minutes, and there was somebody right on the other side of the counter, and they were counting money. They were writing things. Never looked up, not once. I probably stood there two, three minutes. Not once did they even look up. You know, I mean, it's good to know, like, hey, hey I see you. Uh, I'll be with you in a minute. Just one of those. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go off on this bell. You know, I'm going to go crazy on this bell here in a minute. If I don't get acknowledged, you know. And, and uh, but not one person, there's so many workers there, not one person was like, I see you. And, 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 and so you start to feel like, am I even really here, right? Start to doubt yourself, and am I, I, you know, am I a hologram? I don't like feeling like a, I don't like feeling like a cardboard cutout. And, uh, you know, sometimes we feel like that when it comes to God, right? That he's not really paying attention to us. 
And, but the scriptures teach us, and we're going to see this morning, that he says uh, he is El Roy. He is the God who sees me. He's the God who sees me. Now, for some, this may be a scary thing, right? You're like, oh, no, he sees me, right? He saw what I did, right? <laughs> and yes, he sees everything that we do. He sees it all from beginning to end. He sees, there's nothing that we can hide from him. Scripture says there's nothing in all creation hidden from his sight. Yeah, and so, yes, he, 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 sees, he sees it all. But this is speaking of a kind and a caring and a compassionate seeing. He sees you through his goodness. God sees you through his goodness. A seeing that says, I know you fully. I, I see you. I, I understand. He sees you so much. He, he even understands your perspective. I, I understand your perspective. I, see, uh, I can see life through your eyes. That, that I know everything about you on the outside and I know everything about you on the inside. I know things that were before you, before you were around. I know everything that's going on in your life now and I know things that you don't even know that haven't even happened yet in the future. I know all things. I see where you're at. I know who you really are. You are seen. You are known. You are not alone. I, I care about you. I know, I know you better than you do. God says, I know everything about you, and I love you. I know everything. You don't have to hide. I see you. I know everything about you, and I love you. He sees you through his goodness. He sees you today. He sees you fully, and he loves you more than you could possibly imagine. So this is not a scary thing. This is a wonderful thing. Praise God, right? Praise God, he sees me and he knows me and he still loves me and he wants me to know him and he wants me to enjoy walking with him. And, and one of the things, uh, really kind of the main takeaway, I, I want you to have this more, I'll tell you right up front, one of the main takeaways, because this has been so, this name has been so valuable to me to call on in prayer, because it's just those moments in life where you don't know what to pray, and, 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 and you don't know what's going on, and, and you can just come into the Lord's presence and say, you're El you're Roy, you're, God, you see me. It's so awesome to just come into the, have those moments where you come into God's presence and you go, you, you know, that's my prayer. God, you know. You, you see, you know me, you, 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 you see what's going on, you, you know what I'm thinking, you know why I'm thinking it, you know what I feel, you know why I'm feeling it, you, you know this even better than I do. I don't even know why I'm feeling this, I don't even know why I'm thinking this. But you do, God, you see. And it's so great. This is so valuable part of prayer to this name, to be able to just, and this can be your takeaway to add to your prayer life, those times where you can just come into his presence and say, God, you know, you see. You see. I don't have to defend myself. You saw what happened. You see. God, you know me. You love me. You care for me. You're going to help me. Elroy, the God who sees you. Awesome. So let's look at our passage where this name is found. It's found in Genesis chapter 16. We'll go through the, uh, we'll read verses 1 through 14 and kind of work our way through this. Genesis 16, 1 through 14, it says this, starting in verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now, this is Sarah and Abraham before they had children, before God changed their name. Uh, her name was Sarai. God changed her name to Sarah, Abram. Uh, God changed his name to Abraham. So if I slip up and I just start calling him Abraham and Sarah, it's the same people. This is just before uh, God changed their name. But right now, uh, their names are Sarai and Abram, and they have no children yet. God has promised them a child, uh, but they haven't seen it yet. But she had a female, Sarai had a female Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So we're going to be talking about Hagar today. Verse 2, so Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, so go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Now in that day, that was a suitable arrangement. It was allowed in that culture. If, if, if the wife couldn't bear children, they would take the handmaid of the wife, and when she conceived, then when the child was born, it was considered the child of the wife. So that's what Sarai suggested. I'm, I'm glad we don't do that here now in our culture. But the problem, the problem with this is uh, God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son of their own that would come from 
both of them. So Abram and Sarai, they weren't trusting God. Uh, they, they, they got antsy. And this is where we are in the story, all right? They decided to take matters into their own hands. They felt like they had waited for God's promise long enough. How many of you ever have done that? God has given you a promise, and, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And, we, and, and the message last week was about waiting on the Lord, and we're waiting and waiting, and, and, uh, and it's not coming along. And so you start to get antsy, and so you start being like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something else. Let me try this, and then we try to figure things out. So, so that's what they're at, and, and Sarai gives Hagar to Abram, and now Hagar is pregnant with a son, and they will name him Ishmael. Look at it, verse 3 and 4. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maidservant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on, her, on Sarai. On, on, on Sarah. So, so now they, they got all kinds of conflict in the family. Now there's all kinds of conflict going on. Now Hagar is showing disrespect to Sarai. She's treating her with contempt because she's like, you know, hey, I'm the one with the baby. You know, who's he going to love more? You know, who's he going to, who's he going to care for now more, right? And, and, uh, and so there, it causes all kinds of conflict. So uh, verse 5, and Sarai said to Abraham, you, you are responsible. <laughs> Sarah to Abraham, you're responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my maidservant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she's looking on me with contempt. So Sarah's really upset and says, Abraham, it's all your fault. May the Lord judge between you and me. She's really upset. Verse 6, but Abraham said to Sarai, your maidservant is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think is best. And Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar, so she fled from her. So that was sad. So now, so now Sarai's doing wrong. Sarah's doing wrong now. Sarah is being mean to Hagar, and Hagar's like, you know what? A person can only take so much. So Hagar says, I'm out of here, right? And, and, and so this is kind of the setup for God revealing himself as El Roy, Abraham and Sarah, they didn't do right. They didn't trust God. Now they brought Hagar into the mix. She does wrong, shows contempt for Sarai, uh, and, and no telling what either of them said or did to each other. So Sarai's now mistreating Hagar. Abraham's not even paying attention, or at the very least, he's turning a blind eye, and he's trying to avoid the whole thing. You know, he's like, I don't care. You guys work it out. You know, what a mess. So Hagar takes off, but where are you going to go? Where are you going to go, Agar? She has nowhere to go. She has nowhere to go. But, you know, when you, when you think about this, you know, the, the parallels of this, uh, of, you know, maybe you're here today and you're a single mother. You know, maybe you're like Hagar and you've been left high and dry. Somehow, some way, you've got a child, but the one who produced that child, you either left them or they left you, and now you're out in the wilderness, so to speak. So Hagar, she takes off. She's on her own as a woman who is pregnant. Plus, she's a foreigner. She's absolutely alone. She has nowhere to go. She has no one to help her. She has no family, no friends, no relatives, no job, no job networks, no connections. Hagar takes off pregnant into the wilderness. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring of water in the wilderness the spring on the way to Shur. Now, in the Bible, whenever you see that word wilderness, it means what we would picture as a desert, okay? So picture a desert. She flees into the desert. Now, we're, we're talking nothing but sand, burning, hot, dry, right? This is the Middle East, you know? It says, then the angel of the Lord, Lord, all caps, that's Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh comes to her. Now, many scholars, in fact, probably most scholars, believe that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. That this is, you know, whenever that title is used in the Old Testament, the, the angel of the Lord, it, it's because, not just an angel, but the angel of the Lord, uh, most scholars believe it's Jesus before he came to earth to die for our sins. And he makes many appearances before he comes. And we looked at one of those in our Jacob series. And so here's Jesus coming to Hagar and he engages her in conversation. Look at it, verse eight. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? He comes to her and says, okay, you're out here in the middle of nowhere. How did you get here? In other words, you know, what's happening in your life to have brought you to where you are now? Now, he knows, 
He knows, but he's engaging her in conversation, and he wants her to talk to him. He wants her to talk to him. So she said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Verse 9, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. So she's having a conversation with God out in the desert. Hagar, tell me about what's happened in your life. She says, you know what? The woman I work for is awful. She's mean. I ran and got out of there. And he says to her, I want you to go back and I want you to learn to develop a submissive attitude. Now, so what's going on here? What is this saying? You know, we can go to God and we can be praying to God and ask God to help us, and he will help us. He will meet our needs, but I shouldn't be surprised, uh, I shouldn't be surprised along the way if I'm praying about one thing and God has a little talk with me and says, I want to help you and I will help you, but there are a few deeper things in your life going on right now. It's not just all out here. You know, you want my help with all these situations, but there's some things inside I want to help you with too, right? You're just concerned about the outside things, but I'm concerned about the inside things as well. I want to help you with those. And so I'm going to use these outside things to help you on some of these inside issues. And I'm going to use this situation as an opportunity to fix a deep rooted issue. Because what good is it going to do me if God keeps fixing my problems but never fix me? Right? I mean, if he, if he keeps fixing my problems but he doesn't fix me, what's going to happen? I'm going to keep finding myself back out in the desert over and over and over and over again, right? I'm going to keep finding myself in the same place over and over, and that's not the greatest way to live. So God wants us to grow through things to become more like him. So he's not just helping us on the outside, which he says he will, but he's helping us on the inside. There's lots of things on the inside he's helping with us. So the principle is this, as he works in my life, he is also working in my heart. And it's important to know that because there's many times where you're in your situation and, and you're, you're saying, God, help me with this, help me with this, and nothing's happening. But he's trying to use that situation. If he's allowed that situation, it's because he's killing two birds with one stone always. And so, uh, okay, God, if I'm not seeing anything here, okay, what's going on on the inside? What are you, what are, what are you working on here? Because it's, it's, it's a both and. And so as he works in my life, he's working in my heart because he wants to develop us and he wants to mature us so that we can know him, so that we can know him better. Because what happens is as we begin to learn how to live a life of wisdom and a life of godliness and a life of righteousness, you know, it keeps us from making the same mistakes that got us into trouble in the first place, Right? Wisdom keeps us out of a lot of trouble. You, you know, live a life of wisdom and godliness and it will keep you out of a lot of trouble. I'm not saying that you won't have trouble. I'm saying you will have way less trouble. So God tells her, Hagar, I'm going to help you in your situation and I'm going to help you in your heart. I'm going to help you, Hagar. Verse 10 the angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely increase your descendants so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. I'm going to give you so many descendants, Hagar, you're not even going to be able to count them. And we know that Hagar is the mother of all the Arab people, so a lot of descendants. Verse 11 and 12, and the angel of the Lord said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son, you will name him Ishmael, because the Lord has heard of your misery. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Now, God is just saying, I'm going to tell you the path that this guy is going to take, that the son that you're carrying is going to be hard to get along with, and he's going to oppose absolutely everyone. So he tells, he tells her to go back, and he counsels her, and he ministers to her, and he gives her a promise of a son and says, I want you to know I've heard your request. And then here we are in verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her. You are El Roy, the God who sees me. For she says, truly, I have now seen the one who sees me. Truly, I have now seen the one who sees me. El Roy, you are a God of seeing. Now, think about that. Think about that. She's out in the middle of nowhere. Out in the middle of nowhere, uh, 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 who is defenseless? She is defenseless. She's pregnant. She's a foreigner. 
She's lonely. She's on the run. She's alone in the desert where it's dry and hot and nobody knows where she is. Nobody else sees her, but Elroy sees her, but the living God sees her. I'm sure she felt as though no one understands and no one understands her and no one understands what she was going through. You ever felt that? No one understands you or what you're going through? She's run away. She's, she probably would have died in the desert. She's in big trouble. She's in part, uh, you know, the cause of the trouble. Everything screams, this is a person who is just out there on her own. Nobody cares about her. Nobody cares for her. She is all alone. Now, maybe today that's exactly where you're at. And it's easy when you're all alone and you've got trouble up to your ears and you don't know what you're going to do. It's easy to feel like nobody cares. Nobody cares about you. Nobody can help you. Nobody understands what you're going through, and, and you can feel like you're just out there all by yourself. It's easy to feel, feel that, and I, I believe we've all felt that at some point, and if that's where you're at today, and if that's what you feel today, there is a God, and his name is El Roy. He is the God who sees you. He is the God who sees you right now. He's the God who sees you when no one else is around, when you're out in the middle of nowhere. He's the God who sees you. He sees you. He understands you. He understands uh, what you're going through. He cares. He sees you. He knows when you've been mistreated. He knows when you feel dry. He knows when you're tired. And I'm not just talking like sleepy tired, but when you're life tired. When you're spiritually tired or you're out in the middle of the desert or you're out in the middle of nowhere or you're out in the middle of nowhere with nowhere to go. When you feel like you're all alone, there is El Roy. She said, you are a God of seeing, for she said, truly, I have seen the God who sees me. I've seen God, the God who sees me. She saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. I've seen the God who sees me. Jesus sees me. Jesus knows me. Jesus cares for me. Verse 14, therefore the well was called Beer Lehi Roy, the spring of the one who sees me, the God who sees. That's the thing that I want us to understand this morning, that when we pray in the name of Jesus, we're praying to the God who sees exactly where we're at, who understands fully, who cares for us. You are not lost in the shuffle of life. You are not misplaced, and, and, and God can't find you. You are not lost in the crowd of, com of humanity. God sees you. God knows you. God loves you. Hallelujah. Praise his name. This principle is found everywhere in the scripture. Everywhere. It's found everywhere in the Bible. If you go to the New Testament, so we just saw, uh, this is a beautiful description of God's caring. We just saw Jesus, you know, uh, saying this in the Old Testament. Here's Jesus, here's how he says it in the New Testament. Jesus is talking about his care. Matthew chapter 20, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? This is Jesus talking. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Now, the word sparrows there is a generic word. It can refer to any tiny little bird, but sparrows were a, a, a cheap little bird that were used for hors d'oeuvres. In, in fact, Luke's gospel tells us that if you bought four, they'd throw in a fifth one for free, right? Sounds like a fireworks booth. But, but yet God cares even about the little birds, all the little birds, right? You know what this tells me? This tells me God cares about little stuff even I don't care about all the birds. I'm not constantly thinking about all the birds, knowing where they're all at and what's going on in their life. Like, like, all, like I don't care, right? Not that I don't hate birds. I'm not like a bird hater or nothing. <laughs> but he sees them. <laughs> he sees them. I'm going to get a letter or email or something. <laughs> you bird hater. I'm sorry. No, I, I don't hate birds. I just don't care about all birds everywhere. He sees them. And now the word fall can also be translated hop. And that makes sense because little birds hop a lot, right? He sees when they hop and he sees when they stop hopping, right? He sees every little bird, every little action they make, every little detail. And then in verse 31, Jesus says this, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Amen? You know how 
much more valuable you are than them. That God sent his son. Jesus is saying, here I am. I came for you. I came to die for your sins. I came to give you life. I came so that you can know God. I came to reveal who I am to you. I came. We sang about it. We couldn't go there to heaven, so heaven had to come down to us. Right? Praise the Lord. That, that, that Jesus came and, and, and paid for us, that he, he, he died, that he was born and he lived the righteous life that you and I could not live. We could not live without sinning. We're sinners. That's, I mean, that's you know. And, 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 but he came and he was born of a virgin. This is why it's important because he was born without sin and he lived a sinless life, which makes him the only one qualified to take away our sins. A person with sin can't take away my own sins and a person with sin can't take somebody else's sin away. We need somebody who is sinless. Jesus came and lived a righteous life that we could not, was qualified to die for us, plus he was the son of God and he was crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead. And he did that for us. He did that for you. He did that for me. And those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation are saved, are given eternal life. And he did it for us. Guess what? Jesus didn't die for the birds. Jesus didn't even come, and he didn't die for the angels. The angels that fell, he didn't, he didn't come and die for them. But who did he come and die for? You and me. How much more valuable are you if he cares for them? How much does he care for us? And then verse 30, right in the middle of those two verses, Jesus says this, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Right? I'm resisting a lot of jokes here. <laughs> All week I've been fighting. But nothing, this is saying nothing escapes God's notice. He numbers the hairs on your head. And I was wondering, is it the whole head? Is it just the top? Or is it like the whole head? Does it include like, you know, the eyebrows and the face, the mustache and beard and the, the ear hair and the nose hair and the eyelashes? Is it called all the hair? Is it just the hair on top? I don't, I don't know. But the, the scientists say that the average person has 140,000 140, hairs on their head. Now, um, I have a wife, two daughters. I also grew up with a lot of sisters. And, and growing up, I don't know how they could have so much hair on their heads, and yet at the same time, there'd be so much hair in the drain. Right? One of life's greatest mysteries. Right? He's like, amen. <laughs> I, had a friend, I had a friend in college, and... Uh, um, it was back in the late 90s, so you got to know 90s hairstyles. And he was very, very particular about his hair. It was longer, but I mean, every hair had to be in place. I mean, and he used so much hairspray. And he used like that, that uh, it was beyond, what was it? It was that Aussie, Aussie Mega or whatever. It was that purple. It was, like, it was like super glue almost. And it was so hard. It would make his hair, he would spend so much time on his hair uh, every day, and he got to get it just right, and it was so hard, like if you pushed it, like the whole thing would move. <laughs> we used to call it the helmet of salvation. <laughs> True story. <laughs> but, it's, it, it, but, it, but it's not just a matter of God counting them. It says he has them numbered. So when you run the brush through, and a few are left in the brush, you know, he knows, there went number 37. There went number 115,456. There's number 34,743, whatever, right? The point is, he's that acquainted with you. So not only, this is, this is what this is showing me, not only is this showing me that God cares about stuff even I don't care about, but God cares about every little detail of my life, even the ones I don't know about. He cares about the details of my life even the ones I don't know about, if he cares about birds that add up to less than a penny that were used for hors d'oeuvres, if he has the hairs on your very head numbered, it's just a way to say that God knows everything about us. He knows everything about you, that God cares about every little detail of your life, whether you are aware of it or not. And he's the God who sees, and God sees each person individually. He sees you. He knows you. He knows you. And because You'll never be in a situation where God does not see you. You'll never be in a situation where God does not want to care for you. He sees you. He knows you. You can go to him and say, God, you know. You see. You're here with me. Psalm 139, it gets even more specific than that. It says, O Lord, O Yahweh, you have searched me and you know me. 
You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You discern my path and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, oh Yahweh, you know it completely. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it. I don't even know half the time what I'm going to say. He does. Five o'clock today, I'm going to say something, but I don't even know what it is. He already knows. He sees. He, he knows. He hears. You hem me in, verse 5, behind and before you have laid your hand on me. Listen, God's knowledge of you is more accurate and more intimate than you can possibly imagine. This chapter goes on to say, you know, if I go to the ends of the earth, you are there. And if I go to the depths of the sea, you are there. And if if I take the wings of the dawn and and travel as far as I can, I can't go anywhere. You're without you being there. God, you're there. God, you are everywhere. All your creation, you are there and you see, and he sees exactly where you're at and where you're at in life and God sees exactly where you're at in relation to him and he sees where you're at emotionally God sees where you're at internally he sees where you're at externally and he sees where you're at eternally he sees and knows you perfectly And he loves you. It goes on. Look at verse 13 of Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You're the one who formed me. You knit me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And if that weren't enough, verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I I to count your thoughts towards me, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. So this tells us that God is thinking about us with an infinite number of thoughts, and every thought towards you is good. That at every moment in time, every moment, God is thinking an infinite number of thoughts, more than the grains of sand. He's thinking an infinite number of thoughts about you all the time, and every thought towards you is good. Because he is good. He's the holy God. In him is no sin. He doesn't think like us. And, 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 and uh, you know, we tend to think that God is thinking bad about us, right? We think, oh, God is, he's, he's, you know, he's always mad at me. He's always thinking bad about me. But no, he thinks about us with thoughts that are godly and precious and good and kind and compassionate and merciful and caring. Each of us. Psalm 33, verse 13 through 15. I want you to see this because this is really cool. Verse 13, from heaven, Yahweh looks down and sees all mankind. So God sees everybody. He sees you. You're part of mankind. You'll you'll never be in a situation where God does not see you. Verse 14, from his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the heart of all, who considers everything that they do. Now, God not only knows what you do, God considers what you do. Isn't that interesting? That he thinks about what you do. That, that not just some of the things that you do, everything that you do. This is incredible. This is a personal God who, who, who not only knows you personally, but knows everything personally about you and thinks about it and loves you. That's awesome. He is Elroy, the God who sees you, the God who sees everything about you and loves you. Now, let me just say this. Uh, Hagar did the right thing. You know, she was in the middle of the desert. She knew she was in big trouble. She called out to God, and he let her know that he's the God who sees. He's the God who knows. He understands that he's going to help her, that he's going to work in her life. He's going to work in her heart and on her behalf. And, And God reveals himself to her. But what's interesting is a little bit later in Genesis chapter 21, Isaac is now born to Abraham and Sarah. It's 13 years later. Isaac is born, and Sarah kicks Hagar out with her son Ishmael. Abraham gives her some food and basically just a skin of water and sends her out in the middle of the desert. And this is what it says in Genesis chapter 21, verse 14 through 18. Hagar went her away and wandered in the desert of Beersheba, When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. This is Ishmael. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. 
God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. In other words, you're not going to die. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Look at this, verse 19. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she um, went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy to drink. Now it says, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. Did you catch that play on words? The God who sees opened her eyes so she could see. The God who sees opened her eyes so she could see. You know what? That's what happens when we get into the presence of the Lord. That's another amazing thing about prayer. And and I encourage you to develop a prayer life and to pray and and to get with the Lord in his presence every day, at least some, because it's not just, you know, this this is another amazing thing about prayer. It's not just God miraculously zapping your situation, though he can do that. But one of the things about what prayer does is when we begin to pray about things, we begin to get a clarity on things. That, that God intimately taking the time to show us things uh, about life and to reveal himself to us. That God begins to open our eyes and we begin to see more from his perspective. You ever have that happen? You're praying and something comes to your mind that you've never thought of before? Ever had that happen? You know, that's maybe why it's good sometimes to pray with a, with a little pad and, paper and pen uh, uh, nearby. But it's amazing when I'm praying how many ideas and promptings from the Lord come into my mind and into my thinking. He's the God who sees so he can open our eyes so we can see. He's the one who sees so he can open our eyes to see who he is and what he does. Because there's many times we're in a situation and, and we don't know what's going on and we're very frustrated or we're hurting and, 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 and we get alone with Elroy and, and he's the God and he begins to show us what he's doing and how he's working in our lives and how he's molding us and shaping us and he, and he, begins, to, he begins to help us to see things that we couldn't see otherwise. And, and, and it's in prayer, he begins to, it's in prayer, we, 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 he, he opens our eyes so we can see who he is and what he does. It's in prayer that God changes the way that we see him. You may think, oh, God's mad at me all the time and God hates me and all this stuff. Hey, you get into prayer. Prayer changes the way God, the God who sees changes the way that we see him. No, he loves you. He cares for you. He gave his son for you. Jesus came willingly for you. He loves you. So it's in prayer that God changes the way we see him. It's in prayer that God changes the way we see the world. It's in prayer that God changes the way we see our situation. It's in prayer where God changes the way we see others. It's in prayer where God changes the way we see ourselves. He changes the way we see the God who sees and God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She cried out and the God who sees saved her life, saved her son's life and he wants to save yours. And he wants to help you and he wants to reveal himself to you. So with that being said, with every head bowed and eyes closed, would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we wrap up this morning? But you may be here and, and um, man, a lot of things going on. <laughs> you need God to open your eyes to things or... Or maybe you don't know the Lord. You know, maybe you're here today and you could be a single mom. You could be a widow, a single person. You could be a married person and feel like you're single. But you feel like you're all alone. Or you struggle with loneliness or that no one understands you or what you're going through. No one understands how you feel or, or maybe that no one cares. Maybe no one else does understand. But Elroy understands. God understands. Maybe no one does care, but God cares. He's the God who sees you. You know, the the devil wants you to think that God doesn't see. The devil wants you to think that God doesn't care, that God's not going to do anything, and the proof of that is you're out in the desert all by yourself. So why call on God? Because you're the one in the mess. God 
speaking to you this morning. Don't miss it. There is a God in heaven who sees you. He loves you. He's not forgotten you. He's the God who sees you. He's El Roy. He's the God who sees me through his goodness. He's the God who looks after me. So in just a moment, we're going to open up these altars and, and we're going to spend some time. You can join me here, up here. We're going we're gonna to pray that God, would you touch my eyes? Would you open my eyes and help me to see you and see my situation and see things better from your perspective, God? We're going to do that in just a moment. But before we do, with every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to give uh, anyone in here or listening online an opportunity to, to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here, you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you're, you're a, you've wandered a long way off and, and you want to come back and you want to rededicate your life. You know, you can be 10,000 steps away, but it's only one step back because he loves you because he's right there and he sees you and he's with you. And he knows you. Maybe you've never, you've never seen your need for God. I pray that he would open your eyes this morning. Maybe you've never seen your need for salvation. But, but maybe you've never seen that, you know, th this life isn't all that there is. You know, we just see this life, but there's another one coming that's more important. And, and our default destination is in heaven that we can ruin by being bad and earn back by being good. We have to be saved. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says there's no other, na no other name in heaven by which we must be saved. We have to be saved. And God wants to save you. God wants to give you eternal life. And he sent his son. He did everything for us. He did, there's a thousand steps to be saved. God did 999 of them. And you only have to do one. You have to take your free will. And you have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you. You have to receive his forgiveness. You have to receive him into your life as the Lord of your life. Would you do that this morning? Believers, would you begin to just pray, Lord, that, that scales would come off of people's eyes, that they would see their need for God, their need for salvation. If you're here this morning with no one looking around, this is between you and God. If you're here and you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, would you just signify that with an upraised hand and say, that's me. I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I see that you see me, and I want to know you. If you're online, God sees you. God knows where you're at, where you're watching this, when you're watching this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to give you an opportunity. Church family, could we just celebrate uh, those that <laughs> making decisions. Like Brock said, Pastor Brock said just a little bit earlier, we have a Next Steps card. If you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and uh, would you just take that Next step card and mark, you made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that I want to be water baptized and immediately following the service right on the other side of this back wall. There'll be people there to receive you and be able to help you with your next steps. We don't want you to have to do this alone. We want to journey with you, and we have some uh, resources that we want to make available to you. Uh, so in just a moment, we're going to open these altars that the one who sees you will touch our hearts and be able to help us see that we couldn't see before and that God would just become very, very real to you because now is a moment of faith and God's going to speak to you about your situation up at these altars. So I, I don't miss this opportunity. He's here and, 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 I, and I want you to believe that God is going to help you to see as you call out to him. You call out to him, God, you know, just come into his presence and say, God, you see, you know, you know my situation, you know me, you see and just call out to him and then would you listen with your spirit what he would what he would say to you. Would you just stand? And I'm gonna s conclude in a word of prayer. And then would you meet me at this altar? And would you just come and say, God, you see me, you know. And then would you just be still before him and let him speak to you ab about that? If you're watching online, we love you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you. I see you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.